So Mark, so excited to have you on the podcast. Your dad was on the podcast, you said. So, uh, yeah, so it was actually my father-in-law. So oh, okay. He was, back. he was back in March. He was on the podcast. He's the one that introduced me to it. You know, he said he was going to be on this and I had never heard about it. Yeah. And I listened to his story first and then I binge listened to all the stories before his. And then just every week I listen to the stories and they're incredible and they're amazing. And I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Well, I'm so excited to have you on and we're, we're both in St. George, which is just so coincidental and awesome. Yep. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about you. Are you married, have kids? Like tell us a little bit about you and then we'll jump into your, your story. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm married. Uh, my wife and I've been married for 15 years. We have a 14 year old son together and I have an adult stepdaughter now and I'm a pharmacist by profession. And my wife, she's the primary music leader on our ward, and I'm currently the Elder Scorn president. Awesome. Cool. Well, so great to have you on. Let's let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Yeah, let me give you a little background about my growing up. I grew up here in St. George, actually. This is my hometown. Awesome. And me too. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I remember from your story. Yeah. I, did, I went to Dixie High School, but, you know, that's in the past now. Yeah. With the snow cannon. But, uh, <laughs> yes, I did. But my upbringing here in St. George, it was really picture perfect. Like my parents are amazing. We went to church every week. They taught us the gospel. I gained a testimony growing up. I mean, I was definitely a good kid. You know, have you have some of those kids that maybe aren't so good and you have a good kid crowd and I was definitely among the good kid crowd. I wanted to do what was right. I believed in the gospel. I mean, I got straight A's in high school. I never did school. I never did seminary. I got along with all my brothers and sisters. I was like a perfect kid. And uh, that's just how my upbringing was. So when I hear other people's stories about some of the stuff they went through, I'm like, man, that's crazy. Like my life growing up was pretty much picture perfect. When I graduated from high school, I knew I wanted to go on a mission and serve a mission. And so I went and I was called to serve in Texas McCallum, which is South Texas. And I learned Spanish for that. And I loved the MTC. And my mission, it was a picture perfect mission. You know, I, I felt the spirit so strongly teaching and testifying during those two years as I taught people the gospel and brought them to Christ, that my testimony was strengthened. I worked hard. I was obedient. It was really just picture perfect and it couldn't have been better as well. Awesome. And so my life's just, yeah, it was great. And I returned home and I moved in with my parents, you know, just doing what return missionaries do, going to school, trying to date and meet a wife and figure out a career. And I was attending back then. It was Dixie State College. Now it's Utah Tech and just living at home, going to the singles ward. And I really saw the benefit from the the habits that I developed in my mission. So I, I kept up as many of those habits as I could after my mission. I kept on studying the scriptures. I woke up early. I prayed, you know, going to church. It was like at least a year before I even watched a movie or listened to music. I was wow. just that I was just that self-disciplined because I loved it and I loved the gospel and loved everything about it. I was in the Elders Quorum Presidency in the singles ward and I went out with the missionaries every week teaching lessons, uh, the Spanish missionaries. I was a temple worker and worked in the baptistry every week. So it was like things were just perfect and they were going great. Mm -hmm. And, but just because, you know, you're doing all these things right, it doesn't mean you're resistant to temptation. And I was tempted to view pornography. The internet came more accessible in the early 2000s. That's when I had finished my mission. And uh, I succumbed to the temptation and I got addicted to pornography, even when I was doing all these things right. And this was kind of hard for me because... I didn't know how to deal with really sin and what to do about it because that never happened to me. Everybody knew me as a good kid. Mm -hmm. And so I had this problem and I was so ashamed and so embarrassed about it. And I didn't go to my bishop. I didn't tell any, anybody about it. And I just kind of held it all inside. But I kept on going to church and really unworthily, I was exercising the priesthood because I kept going to the temple and you know partaking of sacrament exercising the priesthood and giving blessings and things so this really did some serious mental health damage to me i think because it was just so hard on me and the weight was so big but i just didn't know how to what to do with it i kind of just retracted back into myself and became less energetic in life less connected with people around me and with god really 
and it was because of sin and just what I was dealing with. And I finished at Dixie. So I'd had this addiction at going to Dixie for maybe about a year, just living at home. And then I moved to Salt Lake City in hopes to get into pharmacy school. And I moved there. And since nobody knew me before, it's, it allowed me to kind of just sit back in the shadows. I would still go to church every week because I still loved the gospel, but I just kind of didn't actively participate. I was just going through the motions, you know, not feeling the joy that comes from living the gospel. And I was going to church to another singles ward, but I just kind of sat in the back and I was just kind of dead to my, to my spirit because I was dealing with that problem. Three years had passed now since I've been home from my mission. And my younger brother was actually getting married in the temple and I couldn't go. I let my recommend expire and I didn't attempt to renew it and didn't think I could. And so that was really hard on me that he was going and I couldn't be there for that because we were so connected growing up. We were best buds. And, but the good thing that came out of that is it gave me the courage to go meet with my bishop. So after that, I was like, okay, I'm going to get this under control. And those bishops in the singles ward, they're so awesome. He, he was like too nice to me. I was like, he's like, oh, you're so good. Thanks for coming in. I'm like, no, come on. You got to be a little tougher on me here for what this, this problem I have. Anyways, I met with him consistently for a few months, just, you know, like every week. And I think just through sheer grit and through his support and just kind of helping me through it, I was able to get a handle on it. And he said I was, you know, I was for, you know, good to go, but I just didn't feel the same. I was like, but I didn't say anything about it. I just kind of held stuff inside. And he's like, well, he says I'm good to go. I guess I, I am, but I didn't feel something to change on the inside. And I just, I was still not feeling that connection to God and feeling the spirit. I think it had just done some more deep damage than he realized, or even I realized. But I did happen to meet my wife around this time, or we dated for about a year. And we were able to get sealed and married in the Bountiful Temple because I was abstaining from pornography and just, and you know, people think, okay, well, that, it's just going to get perfect from there on out. But I think just, it was so deep rooted, these issues that I was had inside that my marriage wasn't really that good. My wife and I, we weren't that connected. I wasn't experiencing the joy and having the joy in the gospel that, you know, they say that you're supposed to have, you know, you get married and start your life and things, but I just kept on going through the motions, kept on going to church. My wife, she periodically sensed things were wrong. If she ever pressed me about it, I always just said things were fine because I always just kept things inside. And I did get into pharmacy school. My wife got pregnant with our son and I was working a lot in addition to going to pharmacy school. And so life was stressful and I didn't know how to deal with it. And I wasn't going to God for help because I felt distant. And so we're just kind of building all this like stress and this pressure. And I think I was going through a depression, but I didn't know it. I was just going through the motions of life. And when I graduated from pharmacy school, the job market in Utah wasn't good. So we had to pick somewhere else to live. And my wife actually, she spent her high school years in Florida. She had family there. And so that was better as, than a lot of places and as good as any place. So I was offered a job in Florida. And so we uprooted our family and we moved to Florida. I just started working a lot. You know, we, we had a better life because I had more money, but with increased taxes and tithing and student loans, we were just broke on a different level. And I was just working a lot. And my life didn't really feel like it was going the way that I had envisioned it. And I didn't know how to deal with it really. It was just like, man, this is, I'm working a lot. I'm not really feeling joy in my marriage and my life. My wife and I were growing more distant with time. And to kind of deal with this, this stress and this pressure, I relapsed and I began viewing pornography again. And my wife, she knew nothing about it. This really did a number on me again, because I'm like, man, what a loser am I that I overcame it. And now I have this problem again. And now I was married. So it's like, this is you know not right to my wife, but I had the problem and I couldn't bear to let her know about it or anybody else. I was too embarrassed and ashamed. So that's just how it was. And I was just going through the motions, still going to church. I didn't know it at the time, but when we moved to Florida, there was a major problem with opioids. So this is back in like 2010. And doctors were, were giving out prescriptions to opioids like they were candy. It was crazy. I'd never seen anything like it. I remember at work one day turning no less than 20 people away with prescriptions that just showed up randomly for oxycodone. That was kind of the way that, that we as pharmacists dealt with the problem. 
was just to kind of ignore it, just turn everybody away, keep limited supply on hand because we didn't know who needed it and who was dealing it and who was abusing it. And it was too too hard to really decide who wanted who needed it or not. So we just turned everybody away. And if you could get the prescription filled, it was a thousand dollars a month cash at a pharmacy. Mm. And some of the pharmacies that I worked at on on the side to make extra money, that's what they were charging. I remember seeing twenty thousand dollars come in per day for oxycodone prescriptions. It was really just legalized drug dealing and it was it was rampant and it was crazy. Mm. And also about this time, I discovered fascination for movies and uh, television shows in which the characters engage in dishonesty or deception. I don't know why, but I felt the connection to these shows and I was able to actually feel something in life, which I wasn't able to do with normal day-to-day -day living, which will tell you something was probably wrong with my mental state. But I really had a fascination for these. I mean, there's there's a show called Dexter. A lot of people know about that show. I mean, the guy is a serial killer, but he's a good guy, right? Because he works for the police force and only kills bad guys. And so he justified his actions and was doing it for good causes. There's all those other types of shows like the ocean movies where it's like cool to steal things and do things. And people say that they can watch whatever and listen to whatever and it doesn't affect them. But that is totally false. Satan was working on me through these shows and these movies that I was watching. Recently, President Nelson, he said that the voices of the world are engaging and enticing and numerous and can pull one off the covenant path. And he also said, if most of the information that you take into your mind comes through social or other media, be it whatever movies, news, if it's not coming through gospel, he says, your ability to hear the whisperings of the spirit will be diminished. And you leave yourself vulnerable to the philosophies of the day. And looking back now, that is totally what happened to me. Satan, he was working already on me through pornography and all these things. He kind of had me under his control. And he tempted me through these shows and these movies. And I was learning how to engage in dishonesty and deception. And given the oxycodone problem that was going on in Florida, it was like the perfect combination of the perfect storm to create an opportunity for start to capitalize off this problem. And I started to think about and develop a plan on how I might make money from this. And um, the company I worked for, they happened to uh, position me at a store that was a slower store. So it was a pharmacy inside a big store, just a retail pharmacy. And the pharmacy was slow enough that I was actually the only one that worked there. So I had complete control of the ordering of the medications and the pharmacy operations and the cash register. And again, that was the perfect opportunity that I needed. And I just developed a plan over a few weeks process about how I was gonna do this. And one day I just put the plan in motion. So a guy showed up with a prescription for oxycodone. And usually I just turned the people away, but I had ordered the medication, it was on hand. I told him I could fill the prescription, but that was gonna be $500 cash. I couldn't give him a receipt and there was no insurance. And he was excited because he couldn't even get the prescription filled. And it was $1,000 if he was going to get it filled somewhere else. So he didn't care. He gave me the 500 bucks. I gave him his prescription. The company I worked for to need a profit, they didn't adjust prices based on the market conditions. So they only expected $200. And I made sure the $200 got in the register at the end of the day. And the difference I kept. So I pocketed $300. Basically, it was on average that when I did this. The first time I did it, I let the dust settle for a few days to see what would happen. Nobody knew any better. Nobody said anything. And so I got excited. And I got that feeling that I got from watching these shows and these movies. And I felt kind of this excitement, like I was living this and I was doing this. And I did this for months and I brought in thousands of dollars extra, taking advantage of people or taking advantage of the company, however you want to look at it. It wasn't money that belonged to me and I was taking it. Now, my wife, she knew nothing about this. This is kind of crazy, but I was able to hide this from her. I took care of the budget and the finances at home, so she knew nothing about it. She was totally in the dark. I mean, I'm sure in my countenance, she could see something was wrong. And again, anytime she ever pressed me about things, I always just denied it and said things were fine and just kept on going through life. So she thinks I'm, she's married to an upstanding, normal, good priesthood holder that's providing for her family and and because I'm still going to church. So this is all going on. So I would get that temporary feeling of satisfaction. But on the inside, I was in so much pain and suffering. 
And I was really just down on myself. And I'm like, Mark, how did you get to this point? One time you were a missionary bringing people to Christ. And now here you are, and you're taking advantage of drug addicts. You're taking money from the company you work for. You're addicted to pornography. And I just started to think that I'm like, I guess I'm just not going to make it. I'm just not going to make it to heaven. I'm just not celestial material. Of course, Satan was working on me. And it was really a saddening fact deep down. But I didn't feel like there was a way to really come out of this. I mean, I had dug myself in such a hole. I'm like, man, my wife, she has no idea who she's married to. Like, there's no way she's sticking around if this ever comes out. Probably lose my job, lose my membership in the church. So I just held it all inside and just kept going through the motions. This went on for months. I was sure that God had just forgotten about me. He was probably ignoring me, embarrassed of me, because I'm like, man, he doesn't want this to ever get out. That a return missionary is now stealing and doing all these things. If this ever came out, it would be such an embarrassment to the church and to God. So I was sure he was just ignoring me and hoping that I would kind of just disappear. And that's kind of how I felt about myself. And I definitely wasn't happy in my life. So after a few months, I was sitting in the back in class in Elder's Quorum, just in my half there state, kind of half checked out, half paying attention. And the Elder's Quorum president, he said, okay, our state president here is here today to teach the lesson, which I thought that was kind of interesting because that had never happened before. The state president randomly showing up to the ward that he didn't normally belong to just to teach the lesson. I mean, we had teachers. And then he got up and he said, I'm here to teach on the importance of being honest at work and in our business dealings. Wow. Yeah, that's what he said. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. I'm not being honest at work Whoa. and in my business dealings. But, and then he asked the question, he said, why do you think I'm here to do this? And somebody said, oh, it's so important to be honest or some other answers. He's like, that's a good reason. But I'm here because I received a spiritual impression that a member of this quorum is being dishonest at work. And the Lord loves this member and he wants him to repent and to come back to him. <gasps> oh my gosh. I know I was, I mean, I, of course I was holding everything inside. I showed no emotion at the time, but I just about fell out of my chair. I couldn't believe it. So what did that mean? It meant that God was aware of me. He knew me. He loved me. He wanted me back. And that's the same with everybody. He's got a plan for everybody. He forgets about no one, especially those, I guess, who were return missionaries who were once doing good. I thought I had gone through some kind of reverse repentance where I, all my good deeds were forgotten through my bad deeds. But he didn't forget. And he loved me and he was trying to bring me back. Now, it would be great if I just said I'd I repented right there, but that's not what happened. I mean, Satan, he just had, I was so weak spiritually and morally. And again, the thought of coming clean of all this, I'm like, that will just majorly disrupt my life. Despite that miraculous event that happened, I just kept on doing what I was doing. One day I was at work and after work, the store manager, he asked if I go back in the back to sign some paperwork in the back office. And there was no paperwork to be signed. There were two higher ups from the company. And they're like, Mark, we know you've been taking money. Now I had always been very discreet and only dealt with cash. So there was no credit card trails. And it was all the stuff that I had learned from the movies, you know, and shredding papers and shredding evidence and all these things, trying to avoid cameras and different things. But he said, we know you've been doing it for a long time and we want the money back. And inside I was like, oh no, here we go. <laughs> I had never even had a speeding ticket before, you know, it's like, this was like a new territory for me, but I was depending on these movies to get me through it. Cause all, everything I learned from these shows, one thing I'd learned is you never admit guilt if they've caught you. I'm like, no, I didn't do it. They had called the police. I didn't know. And shortly after the police showed up too, and they brought them in and they told them what I was doing. The policeman asked me to empty my pocket and I did have money that day. I think they had kind of planned it, did it on a day that I was taking money. So I pulled out the money and I didn't think that was just sufficient evidence, but I guess it was the cops arrested me. So they'd taken me out in handcuffs in the store, but I was showing no emotion. I was just holding it on it all on the inside. I would have done this for years of holding everything in. So it's just like, I was as calm as could be. 
they took me to the police station. A detective interrogated me for about 30 minutes. And I still, I was like, I was going to stick to my story. I was not confessing. I was not giving in. I was going to carry this lie out through to the end. I was like, okay, I'll get an attorney. Uh, an attorney will get me off. Help me figure this out. An hour and a half had passed since I had finished work and I should have been home. So I knew my wife was worried about me. She had been trying to call. Again, she knows nothing about any of this. She's just completely in the dark. So I told the detective that I wanted my phone call and I wanted my lawyer. You know, I'm like, yeah, take that, just like the movies. <laughs> but, uh, and he let me make a call and I called my wife. I didn't actually have an attorney, you know. Um, I wasn't Al Capone or Raymond Reddington or anybody. So I called my wife and, and I was going to still, I was going to carry this lie through to the end. So I had to lie to her and I just said, you know, they accused me of taking money at work, which I didn't do, but it's fine. We'll get, I'll get through this and I'll be home shortly. They're about to let me go. I'm at the police station. She was like hysterical, unbelievable. You know, she couldn't believe what I was telling her. And I thought they were going to let me go because I never admitted to anything. And I, again, I didn't think that they had sufficient evidence really, but they took me to jail. So I'm like, okay. Now that was like the twilight zone for me because that wasn't my crowd. There was like drunk people and homeless people. And there I was a pharmacist and, you know, dress slacks and a button down shirt. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like, what am I getting myself into here? They called me up for my picture and I asked the police person to take my picture. I was like, man, what, what do I do now? Like, how do I get out of here? And they kind of looked at me and they could see that I was out of my element. So they let me make another phone call. And again, I called my wife, but I'm still going to carry this through the lie through to the very end. And I called her and uh, I said, I'm in jail because of what they accused me of. But again, I didn't do it. Just figure out how to bail me out. And she's crying and she's hysterical. She couldn't believe that I was in jail. And about an hour and a half later, she showed up and they let me go. So I get out and I think the red flag started to go up here because I was still so calm. I didn't even react. I didn't cry. I wasn't emotional. She's crying. She's emotional. She's asking if I'm okay. And I'm like, yeah, things are fine. We'll, I'll get an attorney and we'll get through this. So a few days later, you know, I found an attorney. Somebody made a recommendation and it was time to meet with my attorney a few days later. And I told my wife, I said, I think I want to go meet with the attorney alone. And I didn't think about what that implied. Basically that I want to tell the lawyer something that I didn't want to tell her because I was going to tell the lawyer the truth and have my lawyer just help me get out of this and figure the best way out. Cause I knew that they couldn't incriminate you beyond, you know what, they weren't going to get you in more trouble. When I told her that she just started to cry and she looked at me and she's like, Mark, if you have done something wrong, we can get through this. I'll stick by you, but I won't stick around if you're not 100% honest with me. And I was like, no. I, in my mind, I'm like, she has no idea. There's no way she's sticking around if she knew the truth. But then I also thought, I'm like, is there any possible way that I can really lie my way through the rest of this without her ever discovering any truth? Because she says that she'll, she won't stick around if I'm not honest. So I was in a predicament. But for whatever reason... I just, I believed her at that moment and I told her the truth and I held nothing back. And I told her every single aspect of everything that I had done. I mean, she was flabbergasted. She was heartbroken. As you can imagine, she couldn't believe it. I just pulled the rug out from under her. Um, she had been married before and her, her ex-husband was a narcissist and he didn't do the same thing that I did, but he had done some stuff and really did a number on her. So here she was reliving this whole thing. At that moment, when I told her the truth, I was so freeing. I felt so good. I was like, man, I could have died at that moment. I would have been happy. And it would be nice if I say things just got better from there. But of course, it still didn't. So my attorney wasn't able to work some kind of magic and get me off of this. I mean, she said I was at risk of going to prison if we didn't, you know, take a deal and try to just not instead of trying to just fight it. And that was her recommendation to plead no contest, which is guilty. No contest is guilty. And so uh, that's what we did. So I pled uh, guilty to multiple felonies, misdemeanors, grand theft, and petty theft. And through my actions and my choices, everything that I didn't want to happen, 
pretty much happened. My life got completely turned upside down after that. Of course, I lost my job and I was put on uh, probation for two years. They, you know, I had to take a drug test every like couple of weeks and meet with a probation officer. And part of the consequences for what I did, I wasn't allowed to work as a pharmacist or in the medical industry at all for five years. Hmm. And so we lost everything financially. And I had all these attorney fees and I had to pay back the money that I took from the company I worked for. We moved in with my wife's grandma and bless her heart. And we appreciate that she did that, but her house is like a hundred years old and we were cramped in there. And my wife and I shared a bedroom with our son and our life was just a mess financially. Spiritually, it was a mess too, of course, because now it's like I've come to the realization of really where I'm at with my spirit. My wife, she's still sticking by me at this time, but I'm sure she's not wishing that she did. She's just, you know, our marriage is a mess. All trust is destroyed. And I got a job cleaning carpets and delivering pizzas. So that's what I did for work. And that was embarrassing and humbling as well. And we were on food stamps and church assistance and parent assistance and every assistance. And, our, and it was just our life was a mess and it was a shambles. And it was because of my choices and my actions. And it couldn't get any worse besides my family leaving, leaving me. But, you know, a few months had passed. And I'm like, man, it really couldn't get any worse. This is, I've hit rock bottom. And I met with my bishop and my state president. And in my mind, I had just strayed too far from the path. I just was like, I don't know. I just can't see myself ever becoming that person that I once was, you know, the missionary I, who I was bearing testimony of Jesus, bringing people to Jesus, have been worthy to exercise the priesthood. It just seems so far distant, but they, they said that I could be clean through the atonement of our savior, Jesus Christ, and that I could come back from this. And I was, and I believed him and I had hope in what they said. And that's all I had to go on was the hope. But I had to make a decision and a choice on what I was going to do. Cause I'm like, okay, I had done things my way. I had had a cynical attitude at times, you know, about the church and sometimes their recommendations regarding maybe appearance or, you know, your hair or beards or different things. And, and I decided if I was going to make this right, I had to commit myself a hundred percent to living the gospel and to not be, you know, half in and half out. And I had to give up my will and I humbled myself and I changed my attitude about everything a hundred percent. And I looked and I said, you know what I did that didn't bring me joy and happiness. That took my life down to the gutters. And so I said, I'm, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do my best and I'm going to work at it and I'm going to do things right. And so I just plugged away one day at a time, just doing things right. I began the study of the book of Mormon, serious study of the book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon came to life with the words of Jesus Christ and his atonement and its power to clean and heal from sin and suffering and pain and all these things. And I prayed sincerely. The process was slow. It wasn't just all of a sudden things were fixed. It was so slow and it was painful and our life was still a mess. But little by little, I just kept doing these things and I started to feel the spirit again in my life and things started to get better. Then before I knew it, a year had passed after all this, and they let me off of probation a year early because mm -hmm. of, you know, just complying with everything they said. I was never excommunicated, which I was grateful for, but I was unofficially disfellowshipped. I couldn't partake of the sacrament or attend the temple or hold a calling and different things like that or speak in church and pray. And that was going on through that whole year. But after a year, I was able to partake of the sacrament again. And then before I knew it, I was going to the temple and I was just plugging away one day at a time, doing the right thing. You know, I looked at my life and I looked at the apostles and the general authorities and I could see happiness in their lives and just the way they live. They always exude happiness. I'm like, okay, I don't care what they say. I'm going to do whatever they tell me to do. I'm going to follow their example. I made sure that I always had a white shirt, tie and a suit at church and I cleaned up my appearance. They didn't have long hair. They didn't have beards. I wasn't going to either. And just whatever they recommended, whether it was an elders quorum president or my bishop or state counselor, I didn't care. I just was obedient to what they said. And that was because I knew that there was no other path to happiness and joy. And there's so much joy that comes from living the gospel and just being obedient to our inspired leaders. 
I mean, this is Jesus's church. And I know that. And I show my love to the Lord by being obedient. And we're just doing the best we can with our church. I mean, I know the leaders aren't perfect, but I kind of see them like this is Jesus's football team, if you want to say. And they're the coaches, right? So they're just doing their best. And we can either like bicker and kind of be negative and, you know, just murmur about what they're saying, or we can just do our best and just plug along and listen to what they're saying and obey the coaches and just make the best of it and try to bring people to Christ through the church. And so little by little, things just got better. And it was still hard. It was still painful a lot of times because I wasn't making any money and we were broke and my student loans, they were just growing out of control because I couldn't pay them. We're still suffering financially for that because they doubled over the time that I wasn't working as a pharmacist. But little by little, things just got better. And before I knew it, five years had passed. And they said I could work in pharmacy again. And I had to take some pharmacy exams and appear before some pharmacy boards to like plead my case, you know, work my profession again. But before I knew it, I had a job and I was working as a pharmacist. And my marriage was getting better and my life was getting better. And before I knew it, 10 years had passed and I was called to be the elders quorum president of the ward. So it's been 12 years now since those events happened. I'm currently the elders quorum president. My life is amazing. My wife and I, our marriage is unbelievable. I mean, we went through therapy and counseling and all that for years and it was hard and it was painful, but my life is unbelievable. I'm so blessed. I mean, I have a testimony of the savior and the atonement of Jesus Christ and its power to change and heal and cleanse from sin. I am living proof right here. People, that, they don't know that I went through this. People that just know me now within the last few years, anytime I mention there, they just don't believe. And even my wife and I, we can't even believe that we really went through this. Our life is that good compared to how it was and all the things. And it's all because of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the atonement and the power it has to help and heal and, and strengthen. And I don't know what else to say. That's the story. And life is good. That is so incredible. Man, I'm I'm just thinking, I can't wait to run out of here and tell my husband about this guy that I just interviewed, how incredible his story is. I am just mind blown. I can only imagine the type of humbling that was to go from being a pharmacist to being a pizza delivery guy to having to go through all of that and feeling so much shame and so much guilt and having to come back and rebuild. But for some reason, when I read your story the first time, I don't know why, but I wasn't sure if you ended up staying with your wife and you did. You guys yeah, made it through that. Yeah, we made it through it. We're still together. So she had said, because recently, as I thought about this, once you said I could share my story, I started talking to her about it. And I'm like, you know, why did you stick with me through all that? Like, because she didn't deserve that. She was innocent. And she said that she takes her temple covenants seriously. And I'm like, wow. So she's a strong woman and she's a faithful wow. woman. And we were married in the temple. And so she was going to stick it through. And and she did say that it, because I changed my attitude and I was willing to be honest that really she couldn't fault me for that. I mean, and she has a past too. I've told her that I'm like, oh, maybe you should go on and share your story. And maybe one day it'll happen. But Looks she, uh, yeah, she's had a rebellious past, but she is solid in the gospel now. And she's amazing. That is so cool. I'm just so impressed. So I want to hear when you're talking in the beginning, you were talking about how you and your wife, you like didn't have this connection. You were talking about how you're going through the motions every day. And I think that people in the church, they can tend to feel this way, almost like they're like bored or something. I see this from time to time where they, they are living the picture perfect life. And then it's almost like they're going to school, doing all the things. And then it's like, like you were talking about, you're turning to the movies and pornography to experience that like feeling. Like, what recommendation would you have for somebody that, you know, they're checking all the boxes, they're doing all the things, but they feel like they're missing something or they're going to outside sources to fill that feeling? Like what, what advice would you have for somebody that's maybe in that place and you, how would you counsel them to steer away from going down the path that you did? Yeah. Well, I think for me, since I didn't really have much experience with atonement and the strength that it can provide and the joy and the happiness and the healing and just the, the bulliness that it can give us. And so I didn't depend on the savior. 
I didn't go to God and really ask for help like I should have, because I should have been sincerely, you know, pleading for that atonement to strengthen me and help me through those difficult times. And also just being honest and finding some outlet to, to share that outlet in. I mean, I really should have just been honest with my wife and expressed how I was feeling to her. I mean, people think it's so painful to, to let these things out and to really give voice to these. But the pain is so much greater. Like it eventually will just be so much greater if you just don't take care of it and just get it out. And whether it's going to see a therapist or for depression, I believe I was experiencing depression and I didn't even know it. And I just was going through life, but I think I was depressed and I, it was because of the pornography. Mm. So yeah, getting help, you know, some mental therapy or, you know, professional help, being open with your spouse, also being open with God and really asking for that help. And also really being committed a hundred percent. Cause even after I've, you know, come clean and repaired my life, there's times where it's like, I'm not as committed a hundred percent and not fully engaged. But the joy is always so much better if I'm like fully engaged, bearing testimony, trying to help others and serve others and bring them to Christ. That's really where true happiness is found. Yeah, I mean, if you're chasing money and other things, they're just not going to do it for you as much as living the gospel will. Mm -hmm. One of the things you said was when you were talking about, they don't have a beard, I'm not going to have a beard. They're wearing a white shirt, I'm going to wear a white shirt. And that resonates with me so much because, I mean, you're familiar with my story. And, you know, when I was like, my life was in shambles. And at this point, like, do I know why they're asking me not to drink coffee? No. Did I think it was dumb? Sure. I'm at a point where that doesn't matter to me. I see the light in these people's eyes. I see the joy that they have. And I will do whatever it takes to get what they have because I am clearly missing something. And so I don't care what they ask me to do. I will do whatever it is. And I just, I love that you said that because I think in that moment where we're willing to do whatever the Lord asks us to do, it's like such a purifying experience for us. I will do anything you ask me to do. If you help me, I will do anything you ask me to do. Hearing you say that is, it just really hit home for me because I think being in that moment of it's actually like a really beautiful place to be and to experience just whatever yeah. he sends. Like I, I will do it. And I think, yeah, it's about your attitude and you change your attitude. And I think that's what it is. It's, you know, an attitude in the gospel. Is it the murmuring or trying to find the faults or see that incorrectness or just being happy? I mean, we know the pain and the suffering that comes from not living the gospel. Well, I mean, I can't complain about anything. This is so much better. Life is so much better. Just living the gospel, being obedient, listening to our inspired leaders, just kind of, you know, not having an attitude and not thinking I know better than what they're re recommending or suggesting and just going forward with it. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. You have the most amazing story. I have one more question for you. Do you ever have times where you're meeting new people or you have this new life, do you ever have times where your past comes up and you're just kind of like, do you just openly talk about it? Or do you ever have times where you're just kind of like, Ugh. you know, it was embarrassing for a while. Like it just took me a while to kind of overcome that. And it took me a while to forgive myself too, because I was still experiencing the repercussions from my choices. And I'm just like, you know, this is something that is going to be with me forever. But now that my life is so drastically different and it's like as good as it can be, it's like there is no shame in what happened. And mm -hmm. so I have no problem sharing with it now. I've shared it a few times in different church settings and people have said it's very impacting for them. And I know it's different from a lot of the stories that people share because a lot of people have been through a lot more stuff than I ever went through. <laughs> but I think my story will resonate with some of those who did things right growing up. I mean, I really had the picture perfect upbringing. I was a straight arrow as you could be, but sin still got a hold of me. And instead of letting it drag me down, which it potentially could have, I was able to come out with God's help and through the atonement of Jesus Christ and turn my life around. Mm -hmm. Wow. So amazing. I am so glad that you reached out to me and we could have you on the podcast. Like, I am amazed. Thank well, you such, so much. Yeah. Oh, well, it's such an honor to be on here. I'm like, I don't know if my story's, you know, going to help amazing. people. I, 
man, I we're posting this on Sunday for sure. I could not wait another week to post this. Yeah, well, anything. And thank you so much for the work you do. I love every week. Just listen to a no, new story. And the spirit is there and the power of the atonement and Jesus Christ. And you're doing a great work. And I thank you. And thanks. thanks so much for letting me come on here. Of course. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you so much for being a supporter of the Comeback Podcast and listening to our episodes. It would mean so much to us if you would like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It helps other people be able to find us. And we want to share this message to everyone.